Good morning. Good morning. One, two, third time's a charm. Good morning. Good morning. And so we're, we're excited to have uh, Pastor Ed with us. A few other things we need to be aware of. Next Sunday, following our worship service, we're going to be having a, a potato bar fundraiser for the youth. Uh, the youth always put on a, a tremendous uh, potato bar. Uh, just a few things to, to whet your appetite and don't get too hungry, don't get your stomach growling, but uh, there's usually pulled pork, there's usually hamburger, there's cheese, there's uh, onions, there's all sorts of toppings. If I can get them to add M&Ms with peanuts, we'll be ready to go. But uh, there's just about everything you could imagine. Uh, you can load up your potato, and uh, we encourage you to plan to be here uh, after the service next Sunday. This uh, potato bar, time is also going to be a reception for Josh Mahler in celebration of his ordination. And so we would encourage you, if you would like to come and bring a card or, or in person, congratulate him. Uh, we're going to include that. After, after most people are close to done eating, uh, we're going to have a short little time of, of uh, corporate celebration as well. So plan to be here next Sunday for that. A few other things. Uh, I'd like to announce that uh, West Missionary Church is looking for a part-time custodian. Uh, the, one of the main parts of this is someone who sees this as an opportunity to serve Christ and the people of West Missionary Church. And so if you're interested in that, if you would let us know, um, if you would turn in a resume, uh, we'd certainly appreciate that and uh, be thinking about that. Or if you know someone who might be interested, uh, please let us know. I'd also like to announce this morning, I'm very pleased to do so, that West Missionary Church has hired Carrie Kale as our administrative assistant. Uh, Carrie has served as a temporary administrative assistant for the last few months and so she's gotten to kind of know the job and know the people and even though she's worked with us for a couple months uh, she still wants the job <laughs> there are announcements uh, from the wow group that's the women of west we encourage you to take a look at those in your bulletin um, also some announcements in regard to awana uh, the Awana year is coming to a close, and we have some uh, awards times uh, that we're going to be uh, having in the next, next month or so, so just be aware of that. After the service today, if you are planning to be a part of the afternoon session with, with Pastor Ed, we encourage you to enjoy a meal that's been prepared for for you uh, down at the, uh, at the gymnasium. If you have not registered, but you plan to come, if you're planning to come at all, we encourage you to come and enjoy lunch together as well. I'm told that there's, uh, even if you haven't registered, it's still okay to come. This morning, uh, I need to let you know that uh, Alice Patterson has, has passed away yesterday afternoon. Uh, arrangements are pending, but uh, be aware of that and be in prayer for the family. Uh, 
Alice uh, has been a part of West Missionary Church for a long time, and now she's a part of the heavenly throng. We rejoice for her. May we also comfort her family. This morning also, uh, I think most of you are aware that Israel was attacked by Iran last night, and uh, we need to remember to pray for Israel. And so at this time, I'd just like for us to bow our heads together as we pray, prepare our hearts to worship, and we're also going to pray, uh, pray for Israel. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to be with your people. It's a wonderful thing to praise you together. And Lord, we pray that in this time that our hearts might be open to hear from you. And Lord, as we express our praise to you, Lord, may it be a pleasant sound in your ear. And Lord, we pray for uh, Alice Patterson's family. We pray that you would comfort them and give them strength. We pray for the uh, events of, of our calendar and all the things that that we have planned, and Lord, we pray that each one of those things, each one of those events might be profitable for your kingdom. And Lord, we pray just now that you'd be with the, the nation of Israel. We pray that you would be with its leaders. We pray that you'd be with our leaders. And Lord, we pray that you know, in all of this, that we might see your mighty hand at work. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to church, welcome to the undying body of the ever-living Son, where God's promises and God's people are radically made one. Welcome to the romance of the world, the marriage ceremony of Christ, where God is betrothed to man by proposing with his life. Welcome to the only place where the unholy can meet holiness and yet holy still survives. Welcome to the only place that you can walk in dead and yet come out alive. Welcome to this place, this place, whether on pews or chairs, in walls or air, under steeples or stairs, by thousands or in pairs, this place, this place is legendary, holy, ancient, modern, famous, hated, living, vibrant, ageless, not because of a location, not because there are cars parked on the pavement, not because you made a sign and named it. This place is an amazement because of the one who creates it. Welcome to the place where individuals are shaped into a larger whole, where bread and wine feed our hearts and intoxicate our souls, where race, money, and power no longer have a role, where the outcast, impoverished, and broken come to be consoled. Welcome to our home, the bride of Christ on a reckless search. Welcome to life. Welcome to church. Let's stand together. Put your hands together. I was buried beneath my shame. You could carry that kind of way. It was my doom. Till I met you. Come on, sing with me. I was reading the night alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my too. Till I met you. Here we go. Cause when you call my name, sing it. And I ran out of that grave. 
sing with us. Come on. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. I love this line. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. Yes. Because when you call Put your hands together. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your plan, power in the blood. 
sing, ladies. Jesus, oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Sing. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Let's give praise to our Lord this morning, church. You may be seated. As the ushers come forward. And we prepare to give our, our best to the Lord. I got to tell you that um, when we talk about trusting the Lord, huge trust. We say, Lord, here's what I have. I give to you. You provide it to me. I'm giving back to you what is already yours. How many times in God's word does he talk about that? And he says, test me and see if I do not open the floodgates of heaven for you. So this morning as we prepare to give sacrificially, and as of course we know, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, this morning for loving us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly going to the cross for us and sacrificing. We love you, Jesus. We worship you this morning. We offer songs of praise and adoration and declaration of your greatness. But as we continue to worship, we offer to you what is already yours. We ask you to bless it, bless the gift, bless the the giver. May you be glorified through our giving. In your risen name, we pray. Amen. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine, we are. Do you let us sing it? Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine. We are. Let's just sing that again. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us, now we are. Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Thou hast bought us thine, we are.
Thank you for sharing this morning.
God's people said? You may be seated. Give praise to the Lord this morning. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, looking forward to uh, what Pastor Ed has to say. Uh, this morning, we, we are graced with the presence of Pastor Ed Schutte. Uh, for those of you who've already come to the conference we had uh, yesterday, uh, he had a lot to say about a lot of different topics. Uh, it was very beneficial. We're looking forward to hearing what he has to say this morning. Uh, just be aware that uh, the conference does continue after this, so if you really liked what he had to say, you're totally welcome uh, to, to stay for the afternoon session as well. Um, if you haven't taken your kids to child care or to children's church and you would like to, you are certainly welcome to do that. Um, I noticed that the slide wasn't up there. So if you were waiting for somebody to officially release you, this is your official release. So... Um, so as they're heading out, just a quick introduction for those of you who don't know. Uh, Pastor Ed Schutte is a licensed and credentialed minister in the Missionary Church. Uh, he is from California, so hopefully, you know, you'd be awake by now, so it'd be fine. So he'll be good. Um, but yeah, he, hopefully he um, is feeling very welcomed. Hopefully he's felt uh, blessed by this conference. I know I personally have. I've looked forward to everything that he said. Um, just to kind of let you know, he, he is speaking uh, later this afternoon and uh, specifically on the topic of the LGBTQ community and kind of how do we respond to that and what do we do. So look forward to that this afternoon, but the message that he has this morning uh, will be good and we look forward to uh, what he has to say because uh, he is a brother, he is a friend, uh, and he is part of the missionary church just like we are here. So we look forward to having him speak to us. Pastor Ed? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to see all of you. Uh, raise your hand if you've, you've been with us for any part of the weekend so far. All right. Fantastic. Well, it's good to see all of you. As Pastor Josh said, I consider myself family. I am a credentialed minister and pastor of the Missionary Church recently turned missionary of the Missionary Church. I come from the Vinia region, which is the Western region. And um, my missions field is biblical sex and gender. I lead a ministry called Before It Begins, and our mission is to protect and promote biblical sex and gender in our churches, families, and communities. And one of the things we do, among others, is speak and do these conferences. And, and, um, but there's a special place in my heart to speak to the fullness of the body. And, and as... As we are worshiping, I was, I was just overwhelmed and honored just um, to be a part of this. And, and I just honor all of you and the way you worship and the way that you do church. It's, it's been very impactful for me. So thank you for allowing me into that. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I guess, just one or two more points introductory-wise before we get into the message. I'm born and raised in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio. I went to school at University of Michigan I've lived in Minnesota also, so I consider myself Midwesterner, born, born and raised, and um, it's just good to be back home um, amongst like-minded people. Before we get into the message, there's, a, I think, a one or two caveats I, I need to say. You know, I, I am in the restorative ministry. God is a restorative God, and in that, I get to see firsthand the weight and the destructiveness of trauma and of wounds. Because if you've been with me the last day, you understand how much I esteem holy sexuality. And it, but it's pre precisely because of its value that the enemy works overtime to steal, kill, and destroy through our sexuality. And I get the privilege wherever I go to hear from people who have been deeply affected, and, e and even here, this place is no different. I've talked to several of you over the course of the last, you know, day and a half since I've been here, all in confidence, um, and I I've heard tragic things that 
break God's heart and break my heart. And, and um, to those that I've spoken to and to the many that I haven't spoken to that nonetheless have experienced something in this area, I, I want to share with you, number one, you are not alone. I, in just a short time, have met several of you and heard several of your stories. And number two, I want to assure you that this message was written before I came here, and it's something that God has put on my heart. And so um, this is going to be uh, a, uh, something that I hope affects us personally, but it's a, it's a message that God has given me in, before I came here in preparation that I believe is a word for the church. And so I want to talk to you about wounds, what they are, what causes them, how they affect us, and what to do about them. So what is a wound? A wound is evidence that something has been damaged. Think, think of a physical wound, although that's not what we're really going to talk about today, but think of a physical wound. It's evidence that something has been damaged. But there are non-physical wounds as well. There are emotional wounds, psychological wounds, spiritual wounds, relational wounds. And there's a difference between wounds and scars. You see, I consider scars, if you, again, if you think in the physical realm, a scar is evidence of a, of a wound that really has been restored, right? It's no, it's, uh, in its purest form, it's no longer impairing um, our movement, our, our living, but nonetheless is evidence of, of a past wound. And then we, have, then we have wounds that are still in a process of healing. What causes wounds? The short answer is sin. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen body that despite being Children of God with the power of the Spirit is, will always pull us, and we live in a world that can tempt us. So the short answer is sin. Some of us at different times are in a place of presently struggling with sin that has given us wounds. And others of us have been restored and, and, or I should say, have stopped certain sinful actions, maybe, maybe even for quite some time, but nonetheless, there's wounds from that. And some of us have been sinned against greatly in the area of sexuality. Paul says these are sins against the body and there's something deeply profound and powerful in the spiritual and physical realm that happens in the midst of sexual sin, and the damage is great. But hear me, church, on this. This is a big theological point that I feel called to stress everywhere I go. The consequences of sin, whether of your own or done to you, do not go away simply because the sin has stopped. The consequences of sin do not go away simply because the behavior has stopped. I'll speak more about that in a minute. So what are some examples of wounds, or more generally, how do wounds manifest themselves? What are evidence of wounds, signs that you have wounds? This is just a list. Um, uh, <clears throat> passive aggressiveness, being angry at the offending group instead of the offending individual, feelings of detachment, Critical judgment, demanding perfection, control, retaliation, guilt, shame, hardness of heart, fear, sadness, anger, anger, and the list goes on. These are nasty, destructive consequences of sin. But you see, all of us have wounds because all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in an ongoing state of restoration, and we are dependent on him and actually dependent on one another. This is a function of the church to encourage and edify and to walk with another. We all have wounds, some bigger, some smaller. Some have scarred over, and they've been restored, and praise God, 
Some are in a process of healing and heading in the right direction, and some, forgive the direct language, but are open and festering and severely limiting what God wants to do in our life. Some of us go through the work and challenge to restore our wounds while, other builds enti- while, excuse me, while others build entire structures of belief and habit to protect the wound from additional damage. But we know that the most serious wounds do not get better unless they are treated. In fact, they get worse. So I believe God wants to heal our wounds, and I believe God wants to do some of that today. Hear this, church. The heart of God is not primarily to modify, modify your behavior. It's to restore the broken. The heart of God is, is not primarily to modify your behavior. It's to restore the broken. We serve a restorative God. Sadly, many of us have settled for behavior modification rather than pursuing the restoration God has for us. But I'm, t- I'm here to tell you that God is bigger and, and greater. He came to set us free from the power of sin and death. And so what does healing look like? When God, I've, I've, I've seen God move mightily. I've seen God, the healings in where I get the privilege of seeing just him taking people out of the muck and the mire and the things they're doing. Look no fur- I have to look no further than my life. The, th- the things that I've done and what I've experienced, I've shared a little bit this weekend and now look what God is doing. He is amazing. Here's what healing doesn't look like. God doesn't erase our past and there's still consequences and effects of sins, divorce, abortion, teenage pregnancies. And it's not always possible to restore our relationships with others. And we often have scars from our past. How does healing happen? Healing doesn't come through behavior modification. It doesn't even come through time. Time does not heal all wounds, although it, it can help. Healing comes from the forgiving blood of Jesus Christ and the powerful work of the Spirit. It is God who heals but it is our responsibility and privilege to pursue that healing, to partner with him in forgiveness and restoration. He has a part, but so do we. So I want to talk a little bit more about what our part is. And in the short time I have, uh, I can't possibly go through a long list, and so I've really narrowed it down to one. I consider this to be perhaps the most common and most powerful element of the restorative process regarding our wounds. I also consider it one of the most difficult things of our Christian walk, and that is forgiveness. These next few sentences for some of us will be the most important things that you hear. Because I want to start talking a lot about forgiveness, but we got to define our terms then. And we need to be on the same page with how I'm using the word versus how you maybe have interpreted the word or come to believe the term. So let me make it clear. Forgiveness is not condoning. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not committing to get back into a relationship with someone who's hurt you. Forgiveness is forgiving a debt that someone owes you. It's setting yourself free. And it's trusting judgment to God. At its core, it is entirely about you and not about others. Forgiveness is powerful, right? It's central to our faith. It's the beginning of it all. You know, while we were yet sinners, Jesus came. And and so this is a central principle of our faith and yet so challenging. So in order to experience the fullness of the fruit of forgiveness, there's a few dimensions of forgiveness that we have to go through. Some of us need to re- still need to receive a fuller forgiveness from God. See, the gift of forgiveness has already been given on the cross, but some of us haven't fully received that and don't walk in that. We reject this gift from God. We judge ourselves according to a different standard. We judge ourselves to be guilty and forever helpless to our past. And this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
See, Scripture says if we're not forgiven, then we remain under the judgment of the law of sin and death. Lack of forgiveness leads to condemnation. We condemn others and ourselves to judgment, and we hold them and ourselves responsible until the verdict is paid. You are never more forgiven than you are right now. And I just want to, the awesome forgiveness power that I've, I've seen God move in my life, I just pray for anyone who needs a, a forgiving touch from the Lord for whatever they're going through. I just say, because of the blood of Jesus, you are forgiven. Receive that. Receive that from Jesus. Now on to the more difficult dimension of forgiving, which is forgiving others. So again, I want to remind you what I said it was and how it's about you, not the others. And I, I, I want to remind you again how hard this is. I want to give you three tips about forgiving others that I think will help. Number one, let Christ be enough. Scripture says about Jesus, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Who is Jesus entrusting the judgment to? The Father, right? Do you trust that God knowing your pain and God being a righteous judge is enough? Or do you demand more? Let the all-wise judge settle your accounts for you so that you don't have to bear that awful load. You cannot improve on the justice of God. All accounts will either be settled in hell, and you can't make hell any worse. Or if the person repents, it will be settled at the cross. And I would hate to dishonor what Jesus did on the cross. Romans 12, 19 said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay you, says the Lord. Tip number two. Be amazed at your own forgiveness, the magnitude and its cost. Consider the story of the adulterous woman that in sin was brought before the religious leaders and Jesus. And we're going to unpack this story more, actually, a little bit this afternoon, just over the course of a few minutes. But, women, where are your accusers? Then neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. You ever wonder how that story would have been different? You ever wonder why, how that story would have been different if Jesus would have simply said from the very beginning, woman, why are you sinning? Go and sin no more. And all the other things was just left out. I'd like to believe that having, after having such a radical and close experience with the forgiveness of Christ, that that woman went and sinned no more. Of course, we don't know. But she was amazed at the, the awesomeness of her own forgiveness. The one person who could condemn her, being faultless under the law, choosing not to, receiving the, the forgiveness. Reminded of the song, I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves us. All of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Remember that all of us has fallen short. And then thirdly, forgiveness is a journey that should not be completed in condemnation nor alone. I'm going to tell you a personal story for this one. And it occurred to me this morning that I shared this story with, with Jenna and Pastor Josh this weekend, and I shared with them that not even my wife knows this story, and this is how she's going to find out watching this later. And so, um, when we were courting, I, I, 
I quickly discerned that my wife still had wounds from the trauma that she had experienced in her past marriage and was on a journey of forgiveness and understanding the power of forgiveness but being naive to so much more, as I'll explain. I brought some communion elements to a date of ours. And my, with the best of intentions, was to take communion with her and once and for all, forgive her ex. Thank you, Jesus, for not letting me do that. <laughs> Darling, if, when you're watching this, this was our, our beloved date at the Thousand Oaks Library. And if I had done that, I may still be single. So thank you, Jesus. You see, I radically underestimated at that time the destructive damage that can be done. I want to submit to you that forgiveness is a direction and a destination that we never fully reach in this life. It is our calling, it is our bar. It is a journey though, much like healing, with the layers of the onion, there are levels to it and layers to it, but that is our direction. As God counseled me and, and I grew in, in what it meant to be a husband and grew in my understanding and as he was preparing me, you know, partly for even messages like this, I realized that my obligation to my wife was to be with her along that journey. That this was something that she and all of us need to go through between us and the Lord. But I can commit to be with you, which is the same commitment that God commits to be with us in the midst of our trials, which is the same commitment that each of you should be making amongst one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, as this local church called West Missionary Church. I shared that story, as I said, uh, with um, Pastor Josh and, and Jenna, and Jenna said, typical man, trying to fix everything. And that's, that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. I think, Jen, Jenna, you'd really like my wife, and she, she, <laughs> she'd like you, and you're very blessed, Pastor Josh. So what keeps us from pursuing the healing of our wounds? Well, some of, us, some of us don't know how. We think, we think that wounds were healed when we stopped sinning or that enough time has passed so it's all taken care of. Maybe we don't understand the healing power of God. Maybe they can even become a source of familiarity to us, even a source of our identity. We connect our identity to the wound and we can embrace a type of victim mentality, holding on to things and creating an identity around it which keep us from love, loving others and experiencing joy. It's hard to pursue healing. It requires transformation and sacrifice, and it is one of the most difficult things we can do, but for the sake of our joy and for the sake of loving others, for the sake of engaging in, in the culture, we must pursue healing. I want to present to you two consequences of what can happen if we do not pursue healing. The first is limiting our capacity to love others. In Luke 7, with the story of the sinful lady who approaches Jesus in the Pharisee's house to pour perfume on his feet, Jesus tells a parable of a money, of a money lender, of different people who had owed the money lender various amounts of money. And Jesus said, Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, her many sins have been forgiven. How, how do we know this? As her great love has been shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. 
I wrestled with this verse, and what, what does this mean? And I asked what seemed to be a rational question, which is, well, what then? Should we go on sinning so that we can be forgiven more? And then you see in Romans that Paul addresses that uh, specifically and, and says, no way. We, we, don't you know that we are dead to sin? And so, of course, we should not go on, on, on sinning. What does that mean? It does mean we should be aware of how much we have been forgiven. For he, he or she who has been forgiven much loves much. And he or she who has been forgiven little loves little. Martin Luther King says we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. Expressions and manifestations of wounds that keep us from loving others, I already mentioned a few of them, passive aggressiveness, critical judgment, control, um, desire to control, retaliation. But you see, as powerful and as biblical and as important it is to love others, as I said, forgiveness is ultimately, and healing is ultimately about you. And so for the sake of your soul and the fullness of your joy, we must pursue healing. In um, Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable of, of the servant and, and um, who's called to pay back his debts. And the servant goes and, and collects debts, debts, debts and throws those who can't pay in prison. And Jesus says, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. You see, when we don't forgive, the jailers that will torture you will be your own forgiveness, unforgiveness. And you can't possibly pay back all that was owed. If you could, the cross would be, not be needed. So my exhortation to you, my encouragement to you is to not be handed over to that torturous jailer because of unforgiveness. Effects on the state, state of our soul for unforgiveness include guilt, shame, hardness of heart, fear, anger, helplessness, bitterness, resentment. I can't say it enough. If you're feeling, remember my third tip, it is a journey not never in condemnation and never alone. And so if you are feeling that in this moment, Reconsider and remember what I said. The Bible says that forgiveness is. In her 2013 novel, the storyteller Jody Pico, the best-selling author, wrote, forgiving isn't something you do for someone else. It's something you do for yourself. It's saying you're not important enough to have a stranglehold on me. It's saying you don't get to trap me in the past. I am worthy of a future. In the lyrics of his song, Just the Two of Us, the great philosopher, rapper, the French Prince of Bel Air states, throughout life, people will make you mad, disrespect you, and treat you bad. Let God deal with the things they do, because hate in your heart will consume you too. And lastly, um, um, former president of South Africa, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, wrote, as I walked out the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew that if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. An unforgiving spirit hurts you more than anyone else. And so can I invite the, the worship team up? Please, or whoever, to, to pad, please. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Do not repay evil for evil, evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Do these things that you may obtain a blessing, 1 Peter 3, 9. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses, Matt 6, 14 to 15. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven, Luke 6, 37. Hear me on this, church. I hate, I hate 
religious abuse. I see religious abuse everywhere I go. I see Christians. I see, I see, I see people manipulate Scripture to command others to fulfill what they th believe forgiveness is. But it's for their own manipulative, selfish ends, and I hate that. And God hates that too. I hate religious abuse. A beautiful thing such as forgiveness, perverted and twisted by people for evil purposes. I know I came with an intense message today, but I came with a life-giving message today. Let his fountains of living water flow through you. I pray that whatever misunderstandings there's been about forgiveness, however it's been communicated or taught or, or said to you that isn't aligned with Scripture, that God just redeems and restores that now. I exhort you to go on the journey of forgiveness for the sake of loving others and for the sake of your soul, never in condemnation, condemnation and never alone. And so we're going to end here with the final few minutes and I want to make room for a time of processing with the Lord. And I want to share with you right now, this is way too personal of a message for me to ask you to do any type of response. So just know up front that I'm not going to do that. I'm sim I simply want to make space for something. And so can you all just bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want you to ask God if you have any unrestored wounds in your life. This isn't an exercise that is a daily part of our faith walk, but let's do it right now. For a moment, allow yourself to think of your past or maybe things that are going on in, in your present life. Sins that you've done or are doing, sins that have been done or, the, or are being done to you. I know this is very difficult, but God is with us in this, and we're just going to take a minute to do this. So I'm just going to be silent for 30 seconds. Just be with the Lord. I was asked this morning, with, I met with some of the Sunday school um, individuals, and I was asked, and we were discussing, how come the church has been so silent in the engaging and discussing sex with everything that's going on in the world? How come we've been so silent and ineffective? And I said, because this is not an out there problem, it's an, it's an everywhere problem. And I said, I'm going to be talking about that this morning. And if you're wondering how come the guy that was brought in to talk about sex just went an entire sermon without saying the word sex, it's because there's something bigger that God had for you today. And as passionate as I am about that topic, it pales in comparison to knowing him and his healing powers. My answer to that question as to why the church has been so silent and ineffective in the area of sexuality in our culture, in our churches, in our families, is our own unrestored sexual wounds. And that's all I'm going to say about sex this morning. So if during that time... God had his finger on something in your life, in your past, in your present, something you've done, something done to you. Then we want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I have some information this afternoon. Please join us. My phone number is there. You can call or text me. I don't leave until tomorrow afternoon. I'd love to meet with you, but way more than that. 
I love if you told someone in your local body. This is way too difficult. Don't make it more difficult by doing it alone. For the sake of your soul, for the sake of loving others, for the sake of your children, pursue restoration no matter what because it is the very heart of God. Thank you. My grandfather pastor for 55 years. I was just thinking about pastors he was sharing. He had one phrase, he used to say, you know, harboring hatred is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. It robs you of all joy. And he was talking about having that release. I chose this because I just really feel like it's where we need to be in this moment. Spirit just directed me here. You're more real than ground I'm standing on You're more real than the wind in my love Your thoughts define me You're inside Reality Signature. Have 
You're inside me. You're my reality. So this morning, I uh, just wanted to say real quick, uh, one of the reasons that I, I liked uh, Pastor Ed and I wanted to get him out here um, was because he wasn't the type of person who said, well, I have it all together and I know how to do it and you're all doing it wrong, so do it my way. Um, he's a man who, who acknowledges his past, who acknowledges what he's gone through, who uses that as a place that he can come and he can say, we all hurt, I've been there too. And I think there's more power in that than there is just downloading a bunch of information. And so this morning, I'm not saying that this is true for every single person in this, in this sanctuary, but I think God can redeem our situations. I think God can redeem what has happened and I think he can use that so that you can speak into someone else's life because you are now specially equipped for that. So this morning, if God is calling you to do that, I would encourage you to, to listen to that calling. If God puts someone in your life, I would encourage you to walk on that journey with them. So last shameless plug I have is we have one more session after this. Pastor Ed is gonna speak on, and then in the evening, he is going to be speaking directly to the youth. Parents are certainly welcome to come if they would like to sit in on that as well. And he's going to be talking about some tough situations. So I'd encourage you guys to, to come to that. Um, we have plenty available for you. If, if you um, are planning on coming to the afternoon session and you would like to come meet with us and you did not register, that's fine. We, we can definitely cover you. Don't worry about that. Um, we'd like to sit with you, we'd like to communicate with you, we'd like to worship with you, we'd like to learn with you. So if you have availability, we'd certain, certainly encourage you to do that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. And Father, thank you for being a God that doesn't just set the world on edge, spin it, and say, okay, well, I hope everything goes okay. Okay. God, we thank you for being a God that is present. We thank you for being a God that is always there and feels what we feel. You rejoice when we rejoice. You weep when we weep. Because you love your creation. This morning as we come to you in prayer, as we realize that we live in a broken world, we ask that you may redeem us. We, may, we ask that you may release us from our pain. We know that there are consequences today. We know that things don't just go away and they're not all forgotten and we can't just move on and have things be the way that they were before. But God, you can redeem and you can get us in a place where we can move forward knowing that you love us and that you're there with us. This morning as we close this service, I pray that if you are calling us to something more, I pray that we would be willing and able and have the courage to do that. And also, I'd like to pray for the conference as it continues the rest of the day. I pray that you have, we know that you have orchestrated. Whoever you want to be there is going to be there. And we pray that we would have open hearts and be open to you. Go with us as we leave this place. Whatever our plans are, May they be honoring to you. Be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You are dismissed. We are having lunch. If you are joining us, um, that will be around 12 o'clock. We might start just a little bit earlier. But you're welcome to join us if you're going to be in the afternoon session. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. 
the chains break at the weight of your glory. I mean. 